Hey everyone, today I'm going to be showing you that light is actually made out of small little particles. I'm going to be showing you the photoelectric effect. This device here is called an electroscope and what it can do is it can measure the amount of electric charge on this plate here. So let's try it out here. An easy way to get an electric charge on this is just to use a balloon. So when I rub the balloon on my head, I scraped off some electrons from my hair and they're stuck on the balloon now. So I can wipe them onto the plate. You can see the needle move. So once it stops bouncing around, you can see that it settles at about that spot. So we can see kind of a relative measure of electric charge on this plate. And you can see I can even add more charge to it. Added a bunch more there, let it settle down a little bit. Now it'll stay like this for quite a while because I have all these electrons trapped on the plate here. But if I touch the plate, then all the electrons are gonna escape out of the plate into my hand again. And it goes back. So this is a really good device in order to know how many electrons are on this plate up here. Now if I charge up this plate again, so the plate is electrically insulated from everything around it. The only way it can transfer electrons off is by the air rubbing against it and the electrons getting on the air molecules. But that takes some time. So for all intents and purposes, this is pretty well isolated from the environment around it. But there's actually a way that we can discharge this just by hitting it with a bunch of particles. And in our case, we're going to use light as particles. The electrons that we're gonna to try to knock off of this plate have a specific binding energy. So they're bound to the nucleus of their atom that they're on. And in order to get them off of that atom, you have to hit them with a certain amount of energy. So any particle that we throw at these electrons that has less than a certain amount of energy won't be able to knock it out of that conduction band. So to start off, let's use some particles of light that have a pretty good amount of energy, visible light. So I'm going to be shining some white light on it, which is a combination of red, green, and blue light. Let me charge this up. All right, so let's start off using red, green, and blue light together, or white light. Doesn't look like the needle's moving at all. Let's go higher in our lumens here. So this is... This is 2,000 lumens shining on it. So we have plenty of light, a ton of energy going into this. But the problem is each specific photon doesn't have enough energy. Even though there's a lot of energy coming off the light, the specific photons themselves don't have enough energy to, when they hit a specific electron. Brighter. Even if I shine 100,000 lumens on it, holy cow. It does not have enough energy to knock any electrons off of that plate. <laughs> so this did not move whatsoever, even when I shine 100,000 lumens on it of visible light. That's because red, green, and blue light simply don't have enough energy when they hit an electron to knock it out of that shell. Let's try something that has a little bit more energy, ultraviolet light. So this is long wave ultraviolet light. So even this long wave ultraviolet light doesn't do anything. We're gonna have to go with a little bit higher energy light. Short wave ultraviolet light. This is also called UVC light. This is the type of light that'll give you a sunburn. So now watch when I turn on this UVC light. So this has a lot more energy per photon released. Here we go. You can see that it immediately starts moving. So we're literally knocking electrons off of this plate with this light now. So it completely discharged it. Watch this again. Charge it up a ton. And see, nothing happens when I move it over without the light on, but as soon as I turn the light on, it just drains it. Look at that. 
So this is amazing. What's happening here is literal particles of light are hitting electrons off of this plate and knocking them off. So it's literal particle physics happening here. What's cool about this is when I use the balloon, I have extra electrons on the plate. But I can actually do it the opposite way where instead of having extra electrons on the plate, I have extra protons on the plate. So I need to charge it positively. So let's see what happens if I charge it positively now. So when I rub this plastic against wool, it's actually going to strip the electrons off of the plastic so that it leaves this positively charged. Now these positive charges, they can't be knocked loose as easy as these electrons because the positive charges are really large. They're the protons in the nucleus of the atoms. Let's try to discharge this with the UV light now. So you can see that nothing happens. But if I just touch the plate and allow the electrons from my hand go into the plate, then it can discharge it. So this effect that you're seeing right now is called the photoelectric effect. And it's actually what won Einstein his Nobel Prize. So if light were only a wave, then that means that it doesn't matter what the frequency of light is that you use. If you just use enough of it, then you should be able to knock electrons loose. For example, if you just get a high enough amplitude and really big waves of light coming in, you should be able to discharge this plate. But you can see that I used a 100,000 lumen flashlight here and I couldn't do anything. So hitting electrons with a bunch of low frequency light doesn't do anything to knock them loose. Whereas higher frequency light, like shortwave ultraviolet light, does have enough energy per photon. So even if you have a really dim ultraviolet light, you can still knock electrons loose. The brightness and dimness of the ultraviolet light only affects the rate at which the electrons are knocked off, but it doesn't affect the ability to knock them off. You can actually do this a little bit easier if you don't have an electroscope like this, but you just have a small neon light bulb. So my neon bulb's right here, and you can see that if I increase the voltage, right now we're at 67 volts. Right when I get around 89 volts, it'll turn on. There it goes. So I have to have at least this voltage to turn it on. But now if I get it to, let's just put it at 88 volts. Okay, so the light bulb is not lighting. The way these neon bulbs work is there's two electrodes in here, and in order to get light to occur, it has to strip the electrons off of the gas that's inside of there. So right now, there's not quite enough voltage to start stripping the electrons off, but we can actually induce those electrons to start being stripped off just by shining that shortwave ultraviolet light at this light bulb. So you can see it doesn't light, but now let's turn on our light bulb. and it turns on. And once I start it flowing, it actually keeps flowing. I don't even have to keep the light on because now it heats up a little bit so it can keep flowing. What's a little bit confusing about what I've been saying is I'm talking about light as though it were discrete particles, but then I'm telling you that it has a specific frequency. I mean, the definition of a frequency is the number of oscillations in a given amount of time. But I'm talking about a particle. How does a particle have oscillations if it's not a wave? Well, to understand this, we have to understand what a particle even means. How do you define a particle? Now, this is going to sound weird, but the actual definition of a particle is the possible smallest vibration of a quantum field. And the photon, like the photons of light I've been talking about, is the smallest possible vibration of the electromagnetic field. And then there are even other fields. For example, a quark is the smallest possible vibration of a quark field. So that's how a particle can still have a vibration because we're still talking about a vibration of an underlying field. But the vibration of that quantum field manifests itself as a discrete particle. This is why we have the wave-particle duality, why sometimes light can appear as a wave and also appear as a particle. Now whether we talk about something as a wave or a particle kind of depends on its wavelength or its frequency. The higher frequency particles like ultraviolet light and x-rays tend to always manifest themselves as particles. So we usually can't see the peaks and valleys of their waveform because they're too close together. So we usually call the higher frequency things particles. 
Whereas particles with lower frequency, we usually just always call them waves. For example, radio waves have an extremely long wavelength and a low frequency. So we usually only see their wave properties and never their particle properties. In fact, we've never even been able to detect a particle of radio wave because a single photon in the radio frequency has such low energy that we can't detect it. And thanks for watching another episode of the Action Lab. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet. And you can hit the bell so you can be notified when I release my latest video. And check out the Action Lab Shorts channel as well. It's where I do similar experiments to this channel, except they're a lot shorter. I do them in less than a minute. And also, I'd like to thank Brandon Fisher for suggesting that I do this video. He sent me some good links on this and suggested that I should do a video on the photoelectric effect. And I'll also put a link in my description to an Arbor Scientific video where they do the same experiment and they show you how to use the materials that I use and where to get them as well if you want to try it yourself. And thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.